Hello, everyone, and welcome. It is Sunday night, May 1st, 2022, and my name is Glenn Rawson. Welcome to our fireside, and thank you for being with me tonight. I realize that the firesides have been a little bit patchy, a little bit erratic. Uh, Debbie and I were in uh, the Netherlands uh, last week, and our fireside didn't come off as planned, but my son Adam did a marvelous job. Uh, chip off the old block, in fact, better than I am. So, but anyway, I'm here tonight, and then tomorrow morning, uh, I leave for a church history trip. Debbie and I are going out on a church history trip to New York. So, but I'll be here next week if all goes according to plan. Now, the first thing I wanted to remind you about tonight, if you have a desire to learn more about church history and the restored gospel of Jesus Christ, then lock out this date. Saturday, May 21st in Logan, Utah will be our next History of the Saints Knowing Joseph event. There'll be four speakers. Uh, all of them who understand church history very well will be presenting. Tickets are available for that event at historyofthesaints.org. So again, an opportunity to spend a Saturday learning church history with Anthony Sweat and, and Robert Millett and others all this Saturday, May 21st, in Logan. We'll, you'll hear more about that as we get a little bit closer. Also, again, a reminder, the book, Joseph Smith Jr., Testimonies of Those Who Knew Him, that book from History of the Saints is still available. If you would like a copy to read the testimonies of those who saw and knew for themselves that Joseph Smith is a prophet, but that book is available at historyofthesaints.org. Now, there are two Facebook pages that are broadcasting this fireside. One of them is History of the Saints, and the other one is Glenn Ross and Stories. And there's also Instagram pages for both of those. It would be a great favor to me if you would take the time to, uh, to, to follow those pages or add them as it were, so that we can, uh, we can stay in touch. Now, this first story tonight, which is the title of The Fireside, and this is where Adam's going to try to help me just a little bit with the visuals. This happened to me just yesterday. I traveled north to Pocatello, Idaho, to visit my elderly mother just before I left the country for the next few months, starting in the morning. My mother is 86 years old and still doing very well. In fact, just before I arrived yesterday, she'd been out in her yard loading a truck and trailer with tree limbs bound for the landfill. And all of that just a few weeks after suffering a fractured pelvis. Now, my dear mother is old, stooped, and tired but she is still going strong and doing her yard work. Well, after a wonderful visit, it came time for me to go home and I decided to take the scenic route. I went up over Mink Creek and down through Arbon Valley towards Utah. Now, I'm not sure how many of you have ever been to Arbon Valley, but it is this beautiful remote mountain valley that runs basically from Pocatello or the Snake River on the north all the way down to the Utah line. It is a beautiful, wide open valley filled with farms and ranches for miles and miles, wide open. And the, my favorite part, very few fences out there. You could get on a horse and you could go forever. Beautiful place. And I have a lot of friends there and they're great people. Now, the casual observer might not notice it when coming down that road, but there are a lot of old cabins and barns all down through that valley, just as there are in Hayden Creek in the valley where I grew up. Now, call me crazy, but I love these old cabins. I like to stand and stare at them and imagine them when they were first built and the pioneers and homesteaders and families that first lived there decades and generations ago. To me, those old cabins are a tie to the past, a tangible reminder of our family history. There is one cabin in particular on that road 
that I especially love. It stands next to an old-fashioned windmill missing its blades right next to the highway. The cabin, and I don't know if Adam's showing it to you or not, but the cabin is very old, very old. All the paint is gone, if it ever had any to begin with. It looks like it rests on an old stone foundation. The wood is weathered and gray. Some of the boards are missing. But what makes this old piece of history so unique is that it is leaning. I mean, really leaning. In fact, the one end is leaning so far that you would look at it and wonder how it remains upright. An old cow comes along and sneezes. It looks like it'd fall right down, but it's been there just like that for years. The point is, it's still standing. Are there not many times in our lives, you and me, when we feel old, worn down, and tired? Sometimes we're like that old cabin, weathered by life's storms, worn down and leaning. But just as that old cabin standing next to the road caused me to stop and admire, so too. Will the inhabitants of heaven and earth marvel and admire you if you stay on your feet, notwithstanding your tired, worn, and leaning and stooped? Stay on your feet and endure to the end in righteousness on the covenant path, and all the world and heaven and earth will marvel and admire you too. I saw structures all over that valley that have collapsed into the dust, into a rotting heap. I saw them and reverenced them for what they once were. But this old cabin stubbornly refuses to give up and fall. May it be so with you and me to the very end until he calls us home. Next story. Now this comes out of your Sunday school lesson. You probably covered it today, so this is probably old hat, but it's something that I observed. Remember when you were a kid and you first played with a magnifying glass? I wanted to bring one tonight to use as an object lesson, but I couldn't find it. But remember when you first played with an object, with a, with a magnifying glass? You held the magnifying glass and you marveled how it made everything bigger and then you flipped it over and it made everything smaller. Remember that? Perhaps some of you <laughs> might have even used that magnifying glass to focus the sun's light and burn something. It may have seemed at the time just an amusing toy, unless, of course, you were the ant got, that got fried on the sidewalk. I would imagine that most of us played with that magnifying glass from only one perspective from above. From above. But what if you were the ant under the magnifying glass, so to speak? Think about that. Looking down or looking up through. Story. It must have been an awesome sight when the ancient prophet Jethro came to visit his son-in-law, Moses, and found him surrounded by his people, waiting for him to help them with their individual problems. Every waking hour, Moses had a line of people wanting his attention. Well, it concerned Jethro so much that he said, quote, the thing that thou doest is not good. Thou wilt surely wear away both thou and this people that is with thee, for this thing is too heavy for thee. End of quote. Jethro then counseled Moses to appoint lesser judges to handle all the small matters, while Moses would judge only the weightier matters. It is in that counsel in verse 19 that Jethro says to Moses, quote, Be thou for the people to Godward, that thou mayest bring the causes unto God. Or in other words, Moses, you represent 
the people before God and bring their causes before him. Whoa! What a remarkable perspective. It is as though the living prophet is a magnifying glass praying and pleading for us and magnifying us, little ones, to God, our challenges, our needs before the Almighty. He focuses from above the light of God on us, little creatures down below. The prophet of God focuses heaven's attention on us and our trivial matters. Thank the Almighty for a prophet who will speak for us. But wait, if the prophet is like a magnifying glass, he can turn the other way, and indeed, he does. Not only does the prophet speak for us to God, but he speaks to us for God. He magnifies God to us, drawing him nearer and flooding our lives with his light and his love and his word. If we have a prophet, my dear friends, we have everything we need. In the April 2022 General Conference, President Nelson said, to make my point, quote, my dear brothers and sisters, I love you. I cherish this opportunity to speak with you today. I pray daily that you will be protected from the fierce attacks of the adversary and have the strength to push forward through whatever challenges you face. End of quote. Next story. Cyril Call was born in June 1785 in Woodstock, Vermont. He married Sarah, or Sally, Tiffany, on April 6, 1806. Cyril was raised a Methodist in time, and in time he became a Methodist preacher. Then in 1817, he moved his family to Ohio, near Kirtland. In November 1832, Cyril Call was taught the gospel by John Murdoch and joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He studied the gospel carefully, and he became a close friend with the prophet Joseph Smith. However, Sally, his wife, and some of his children at first refused the gospel. Sally was brought up the daughter of a Baptist preacher. Their unwillingness to accept baptism greatly concerned Cyril. He confided his anguish to the prophet Joseph Smith. Family records indicate that Joseph listened to Cyril's concerns and then placed his hands upon Cyril's head and pronounced a blessing, stating that, quote, his wife and every one of his children should be converted to the gospel, be baptized into the church, be faithful workers, and remain loyal advocates of their religion to the day of their death, and that his posterity should be lovers of the truth and workers in the Lord's vineyard. End of quote. What a promise. Not long after that, Sally joined the church. However, the story of the conversion of their second son is most remarkable. Anson Call was born May 13, 1810, while the family was still living in Vermont. He grew up the second of 13 children. As he came of age, he developed a stuttering problem, a speech impediment that he could not overcome. He married Mary Flint in 1833. When those missionaries, heretofore mentioned, brought the gospel to his father's family, Anson resisted. He described that their preaching, quote, was a constant annoyance to my feelings. 
I became dissatisfied, he said, with all denominations and myself, end of quote. It frustrated him, he went on to say, that in discussing the gospel with the missionaries, he said, quote, they would cuff me about like an old pair of boots. I came to the conclusion that the reason my being handled so easily was because I did not understand the Bible and the Book of Mormon, end of quote. Cuff me about like a pair of old boots. In other words, he couldn't hold his own. They just handled him with no problem like he was a child. Well, it frustrated him. So Anson took a copy of the Bible and the Book of Mormon and commenced reading the two and comparing the text. For six months, perhaps longer, he studied, prayed, and compared. At the end, he had read both books through, including the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, and said, quote, I became a firm believer in the Book of Mormon, end of quote. Only Anson's wife knew the intense struggle of his soul. Anson described himself as, quote, proud and haughty, and to obey the gospel was worse than death. I studied years hard, he said, to learn that the Mormons were true. I labored under these feelings, becoming at times almost insane to be called a Mormon. I thought, was, I thought it was more than I could endure to be called a Mormon. I lamented that my lot was cast in this dispensation. My dreams and meditations and my thoughts made me most miserable. End of quote. Can you see the quandary? A man whose head is fighting with his heart, a man who cannot bow the knee and accept that the Latter-day Saints are the Lord's true church. He fought back and forth until finally, with a heart broken and a haughty spirit worn to nothing and contrite, Anson said, quote, I at last covenanted before the Lord that if he would give me confidence to face the world in Mormonism, I would be baptized for the remission of my sins. That's a remarkable bowing of the knee. And Anson described that, quote, before I arose from my knees, the horrors of my mind were cleared. I feared no set of men, end of quote. And from that point forward to the end of his days, Anson Call proved himself a fearless and faithful man of God, willing to lay down his life for the restored gospel. And then, in his autobiography, he adds the following, almost as a postscript to his remarkable conversion. He said, After I joined the church, I was administered to for my stammering speech, from which I was relieved. End of quote. And thus, the power of a prophet's promise and a father's faith. I don't know if that story does anything for you, but I found in Anson Call a kindred spirit. Forgive me for sharing something personal. But as I grew up, I was surrounded by those who hated members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And they spared no pains in telling me just how awful, evil, wicked, and morally bankrupt and dishonest members of the Church were. It's how I was raised. And then... I went off to college, and some of my dearest, closest friends were members of the church. And suddenly, I was caught, because these weren't at all the kind of people that I was told they were. These were good, 
honest, decent people. They became my closest, dearest friends. And in time, they introduced me to the gospel. What I don't know that they ever knew was I had the same struggle as Anson Call. I can't be a member of the church. It is the most galling and appalling thing on earth to me. What would I say to my family? How would I face my dad if I became one of them? Moreover, to be religious was the most sissy thing for this young cowboy to become religious, to to talk about God and Jesus and faith. I couldn't speak it because it was so against my nature. And so... The Lord had, as it were, he had to pound me down to the dirt before I was finally willing to be baptized. And even at that, it took a long time before I experienced the conversion of an Anson call. But here I am. The Lord is kind. And I will always be grateful for his abundant and tender mercy to come after Sorry, such a knothead as I was. Let's take a break for just a moment. Would you permit me, just for a moment, I haven't done this for a while. From this book. J.O. sighed. It was time to get some things worked out. It was time for a real talk. And it was obvious she was not going to lead out, meaning Shawnee. He stood, shoved his hands deep into his pockets, and walked over to the overlook where he stood staring out. I started reading the Book of Mormon, he announced without preamble. When? was the obvious surprise in her voice. Two nights ago, J.O. said, in the middle of Nevada. Why? He turned around to face her again. She sat on the bench, looking up at him. The collar of her jacket was turned up against the increasing evening chill. Her legs were drawn up under her chin for warmth. The lowering sun cast the eminence of Scout Mountain behind her, in a sharp contrast of light and shadow. The setting only made her look more beautiful to him, but it struck him how vulnerable she was at that moment. He sighed again and moved over to sit by her. It's hard to explain, but I think I'm going to quit driving. A look of shock registered on her face. Quit driving? Why? It's not fun anymore, J.O. said. I used to love being on the road and going to new places. There was never a dull moment. I loved the scenery and the trucks and the thrill of the open road. It was freedom. So what happened to change all that, she said. He wanted to just blurt out, you. But there was too many ways to misread such a message. Well, let's just say some things have changed in my life that make me not want to be out there anymore. Like what? She pressed. He sighed with resignation. You? She started to say something, but he blurted it out. Let me finish. He looked away as if gathering his thoughts and then said, I've tried to convince myself, Shawnee, that it would never work between us. I've kept my distance, and I've even tried to walk away from you. He paused and looked up at the sky. But I can't. He turned back and looked and took her by the shoulders. Shawnee, let me be honest. And straight up here, I care about you. I love you. And he hesitated as he searched her eyes. And I think you still care about me. It was stated as a question. Slowly, almost imperceptibly, she nodded her head. 
He blew out his breath as though he had been holding it in in suspense and looked out across the valley. That's the dilemma. I can't see how this is going to work. You want a man of God, and I am not that man. Why not? I guess because I don't know how. That's easy enough to change, she said. Shawnee, this isn't a game. And I'm not playing one, she said, but I'm not so sure that's not what you've been doing. What do you mean? He said, an edge creeping into his voice. J.O., I have been with you enough to know that you've felt something, that you've seen prayers answered more than once, and that you've experienced things that some would call miracles. How can you say you don't know? Before he could even answer, she went on. Not once have you come to church with me to see what it's like. Have you been praying and trying to change your life the way Heavenly Father wants you to? Do you expect God to come down and tell you himself when you're doing nothing to help yourself? You just picked up the Book of Mormon. I gave you that book four months ago. What took you so long? Her intensity stung him like wind-driven hail. He started to say something, but she rode right over him, and now with even more fervor. What are you afraid of, J.O.? That you'll have to admit that you are wrong for so many years, or is it that you might have to change? Her words were like a slap in the face, and he felt the anger rising in him. Standing abruptly, he walked over, walked away and stood looking out, though he couldn't focus on anything. J.O., her voice was now pleading, I do care about you, and I want to see you happy. J.O. world, I was happy until... He bit off the rest of what he was going to say. She recoiled as though he had struck her in the face, and then she quietly finished his sentence for him. Until I came along, right? He turned back to the forested valley before him and said nothing. Shawnee sighed. As she spoke, he could hear the pain and restrained emotion in her voice. I guess you're right. This isn't going to, this isn't going to work, and all I'm doing is putting us both through grief. I'm sorry. She stood and began walking up the trail toward the jeep. Can I please go home now? Tempering Steel. Available at historythesaints.org or at glenrossonstories.com. One more thing, my friends. I don't very often, I haven't said it for a while, but all those of you that have loved these stories on Sunday night, please be sure to share them. Yeah, they're copyrighted, but I don't care. I hope you spread these stories all over the world. They're true. I assure you, to the best of my ability and the sources I have, those stories are true. And I would invite you, if you would like to receive these stories every week, to go to glenrossonstories.com and sign up for the free weekly email, and you'll not only get the printed copy of the story, but you'll get a video-produced movie of each story. Please sign up and share them with your friends. And also, these two books are still available at history or at glenrossonstories.com. The revised version of the Old Testament stories that supplement your reading this year and the stories of the hymns. If you want to know more about the stories of the hymns, the background behind them, it's a great book. All right. Moving on. You doing okay? May I just tell you one more time how grateful I am that you take the time to be here with me. This means a lot to me. Not too long ago, in fact, just a few weeks ago, just as spring was beginning, I went outside here in our house, out into my backyard. I went out to do something. I was working on something. And I started in on the project, and then I noticed something. Something caught my attention. 
there was this humming sound coming from all around me, but up over my head. I stopped. I listened. Yeah, it was really loud. It seemed like the whole air up above me was humming, like, like, like the sound of electricity, except different, like a buzzing. It was as though the globe willow trees over my head were alive with some kind of energy. Now, we have more than 100 trees on our property, all just beginning right now to leaf out in preparation for spring and summer. Well, this buzzing over my head caught my attention, so I walked through the trees, and it was awesome. The trees were alive, humming like electricity running through them. Something was going on up there, but what was it? Can you just picture that? I stand there staring up into these huge trees, and I couldn't see a thing. There was nothing there, but yet I could hear it. It had to be some kind of insects, but I couldn't see them. And these trees are really tall. I kept staring, squinting, and then I saw it. It looked like a bee flying from one bud to another. If that's what it was, there had to have been hundreds or thousands of those bees buzzing over my head and pollinating, spreading grains of pollen everywhere, and I couldn't see any of it. I could hear it. Day after day, this went on. Something wonderful in the grand design of the Almighty's world was happening right over my head, and I couldn't see it. But I knew it was big. I could hear it. And so it is. In our time, my dear friends, the Almighty is performing a marvelous work and a wonder in preparing this world for his glorious second coming. The scattered remnants of Jacob's family are being gathered one at a time. It is a huge and vastly important work requiring the efforts of millions on both sides of the veil. And it, too, is running against the clock. Do we recognize what's happening in this world? Do we sense it? And more importantly, are you a part of it? I hope you are. Because one of these days, our eyes will be opened and we will see what was happening around us. And if we were a part of it, how blessed upon the mountains will be the feet of those who bore tidings of good news. If you were not a part of it, yours will be a life and an eternity of regret. Next story. I just came back from Amsterdam. Have you ever felt that yearning desire, my friends, to make a difference in the world? That desire to change the world for good? Perhaps even to live on after you die. If you have, let me tell you a story about how that desire was fulfilled for one unlikely young woman. Her name was Anne. And when she was 13 years old, Anne went with her father to the store where she picked out a red checked diary or an autograph book, as it was called, as a birthday present. She took it home, turned it into a journal, and began writing immediately. She even named the diary Kitty and said in it, quote, I hope you will be a great source of comfort and support, end of quote. And then just three weeks after her birthday, Anne and her family were forced into hiding where they would remain in silent terror for the next 571 days. 
for you see, Anne was Anne Frank, the young Jewish girl who, with her family, was forced into hiding from the Nazis in Amsterdam from July 1942 to August 1944. During her time in darkened, lonely solitude, Anne wrote constantly in her diary. It was indeed her only source of comfort. She filled the red-checked diary and numerous loose sheets of paper. She poured out her heart and of, of all that she was experiencing as a refugee from Nazi hate. She shared her dreams of a better world, free of hate, where it didn't matter if you were Jew or Gentile, German or Dutch. And she spoke of how she wanted someday to become a journalist and help make the world a better place. In the secret annex, as it was called, Anne Frank grew more than five inches in height. She was just a girl. But more than that, Anne grew in stature of soul. As she wrote, she matured. As she wrote, she dreamed. As she wrote, she became a better person. She aspired to write a book about her experiences about the war that would inspire people to live in love and not hate. Anne never lived to see her dream realized. On August 4th, nineteen forty four their secret hiding place was betrayed, and the Frank family, along with all the others in the annex, were led away to Nazi concentration camps, where all all of them, except Anne's father, Otto Frank, died in the worst ways imaginable. Anne and her sister, Margot, died at Bergen Belsen Camp in February. 1945. No one knows exactly the date of Anne and Margot's death, nor exactly where they are buried. It would seem that Anne's dream faded into darkness and oblivion. But the Almighty had a greater plan. As they were forced out of the secret annex at gunpoint, Anne's diary and writings were dumped on the floor and walked over. They were later picked up by Meep Geese, one of the women who had helped the family hide, and the letters were saved and later given to Anne's father, Otto, after it was learned that Anne would not be coming back. Otto read his daughter's diary in profound amazement at the depth of her thoughts and feelings. He read of her passion to publish her writings as a book to tell the real story of World War II and decided to honor the dying wish of his daughter. 3,000 copies of The Secret Annex were released June 25, 1945. It started slow, but was soon translated into German, French, English, and more. Seventy years later, the diary had been translated into as many as 70 languages and more than 30 million copies have been published. The desire of a beautiful, intelligent teenage girl to make the world a better place has been profoundly realized in a most unusual way. Out of the dust, and Frank has been allowed to speak to all the world by the grace of God. I have been to the secret annex in Amsterdam. It remains one of the most sobering places I have ever visited on this earth. It will remain with me for the rest of my days. Anne taught me the deadly scourge of bigotry and hate and idealism run amok. She showed all of us that we too can change the world and make it a better place. 
wherever you are, thank you, Anne Frank. I hope someday to meet you. Last story. The Apostle John made a statement in the book of Revelation, quote, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Some 2,000 years ago, the Jews of Jesus' day commemorated the Passover, that sacred event from their history when the angel of death passed over them while all the firstborn among the Egyptians died. On Thursday, sometime in the late afternoon, Peter and John, at the Savior's command, took a lamb, and under the direction of the priests in the holy temple, they killed it and spilled its blood. They then prepared the Passover for Jesus and the rest of the twelve. That evening, that evening, Jesus came, and they, to partake of the last officially authorized Paschal Lamb. Four thousand years, God's people had been sacrificing the lambs and shedding their blood as an offering for sin. Even now, at that moment in Jerusalem, thousands of lambs would be killed over those two days. For years, the thought of such a thing, and especially as part of my religious devotion, seemed distasteful and disgusting. Why would God have commanded such a thing as the slaughter of innocent lambs? I don't know all the reasons, but as I have studied, thought, pondered and prayed about it, I learned some interesting things. The lamb was a symbol to point them to the time when their Redeemer, the Lamb of God, would come and be the final offering. Consider some of the following. Each of those lambs slaughtered, selected, was male, unblemished, and perfect just as Jesus would be. Each was innocent, undeserving of its fate, just as Jesus would be. Each was meekly submissive, just as Jesus would be. Each was brought by the head of the household to be sacrificed on behalf of the family, just as Jesus would be. Each lamb had its blood forcefully shed and its life taken, just as Jesus would. Each lamb was sacrificed in the holy city, just as Jesus would be. Each Passover lamb was sacrificed under the authority of Israel's priests, just as Jesus would be. Each was sacrificed without a bone broken, just as Jesus would be. Each lamb was of the first year cut off in the bloom of life, just as Jesus would be. And each lamb had another's sins placed upon it and vicariously died for them, just as Jesus did. After the shedding of great drops of atoning blood in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was led away like a lamb to Golgotha where on Friday morning he was lifted up and sacrificed for the sins of the world. For some six hours, the master hung in indescribable agony. And then sometime around three o'clock in the afternoon, perhaps even while the paschal lambs were dying in the temple, Jesus died. The ultimate offering for the sins of the world. And in his offering, we have part. Because of it, we are encircled in the arms of mercy. No more were the lambs to die. It was not necessary. The horrible price was paid. Man was free. Now, in conclusion, for many years, I was tempted to rail and accuse those who missed the significance of the lambs and their blood when it was fulfilled until it occurred to me 
that unless and until I understand the significance now of the bread and the wine or water, I had better be quiet. Watch. Watch the Lamb. My dear friends, I love the Almighty. And because of the love of the Almighty, I love you. I hope you are well. Good night. God bless.